Hello, and welcome back. I'm B. Boyd. On the last gallery, students at the University of Central Florida's Department of Art took their first steps toward becoming a professional artist, using foundational tools to take their talents to new heights. As their conceptual skills continue to develop, new challenges arise. Challenges such as understanding the qualities of a good artist and what defines good art. Today, we'll meet more artists whose contributions in the studio help their students transition from the classroom to the real world. Well, the work in the gallery is influenced by the kind of things I grew up around as a child in Mississippi um, and later on a teenager and an adult. And things like my grandmother's quilt making and uh, hunting and fishing, storytelling, so uh, those things are kind of a, a collage or a collective of all these stories and stuff that I grew up with and I just appropriate from all those experiences and put it together in one composition. It's almost like a crazy quilt, you know. Um, if you know anything about traditional quilt making, there are certain specific patterns that you'll see repeated over and over and over again in quilt making. And then there's the crazy quilt category where they just took the scraps and the pieces that were left over and they just kind of put them together in a whimsical type of way, very spontaneous and things like that. So that's the way I work. It's kind of like a cook in the kitchen. I like to put my finger in the stew and taste it. And if it's not right, I just adjust it. You know, it's not, it's not like I'm following a recipe. School perpetuates a myth that because you get a degree in X, you must do X for the rest of your life. When you look at the history of art, nothing is remotely similar to that. I mean, if you even take the degree in pedagogy out of the equation, uh, if you learn through apprenticeship or learn by reading a book or, or if you're self-taught, when you get in your studio, you're going to make whatever you want to make. If I want to work in clay, I work in clay. If I want to do sculpture, I do sculpture. If I want to draw, I draw. You know, I don't have to have a degree to be a good artist. I just have, I have to know the language, the visual elements and principles of organization and be aware of who I am. I love clay an awful lot. So, you know, when I get in my studio, I, you know, if I can't do as much in clay as I wanted to, I paint or draw, you know, it's all art. We've taken a direction in these three-dimensional design classes that I teach where we try to bring the real world into the classroom as much as we can because I tell the students, and they're probably sick of hearing it, that you know school is not real. When we're in school, all our emphasis is on grades, which is more of a social structure than uh, whether or not a person can perform what they say they can do in the real world. So we take on real clients. Right now we're working with Hard Rock Cafe and we're designing a themed area uh, called Heavy Metal Graveyard for their new the theme park they're building in, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And these students are all competing with each other. Uh, and these students that are selected by this outside review committee made up the Hard Rock creative team will be allowed to work next semester in more of an incubator environment and actually construct pieces that will be fabricated for real. And that's quite a shift pedagogically in 2,000 and 3,000 uh, level uh, coursework. Hopefully now you understand why we did the model first. Because now, when you finish this critique, you probably saw some things you might want to tweak or change a little bit, okay? Now you got time to change that without fear of retribution, okay? To me, it's all about work ethic. I mean, pride in your work, being on time, don't make excuses, make sure that whatever you've done, it's your best effort, that way that if you are criticized or rejected, you know that you did the best you could do and you can live with yourself, you know. People are defensive because they have something to defend. So when they're ready, prepared, and on time, uh, they can take whatever life throws at them, uh, including art critics. <laughs> and I try to instill that kind of thing, work ethic, in my students. I'm not real big on talent. It's highly overrated as far as I'm concerned. And that's random. I wanted that plaque near the plane and then just kind of the luggage throughout the rest of it. That doesn't look random. That looks placed. 
I love my students, and I believe in the kick you in the behind and give you a hug philosophy. <laughs> so, and they do, they work hard. They, uh, they do a good job here, and I'm very proud of them. <laughs> I heard a quote one time from a, a primitive artist. She, she said that painting gave her a thrill of joy. When you have one good thrill of joy, you just naturally want to have another. You know, well, that's something I learned early on as a student is that what I do, when I get up in the morning, I don't have any bad days, even when I have a bad day. And it makes me want to keep going. And it gives me a thrill of joy. This piece started out actually as just a pure conceptual piece, a piece to put in my portfolio. I was probably looking at something on History Channel, they were talking about the Saint Sebastian piece. Basically, uh, this was a guy who was martyred, and the way his martyrdom occurred was uh, through, he was shot to death by arrows, by, I think, the Roman army. And um, I was reading something about, you know, American West, and it was basically about the fiascos that took place during the whole Manifest Destiny era, you know, uh, where there was sort of a political hard line about advancing the country and getting as much territory as possible by any means necessary. And of course, Custer was the prime example of that. So that, it just seemed like a natural sort of blend. I did it as just a standard portrait of Custer in traditional materials. And then I brought it into uh, the computer platform, and that's where I ended the arrows. My work is applied. I don't really consider myself a fine artist by any means or stretch of the imagination. 90% of what I do is done strictly for a client, and it's to meet those clients' expectations and needs and to communicate their message that they're trying to get across. So the platform for presentation for applied art is, is the public. And as you know, graphic design covers, I mean, it's everywhere. You can't sit down on a, a bus stop seat without you know, covering over part of it. It's in, we can encounter it in every aspect of our lives in American culture. And that's essentially the area that I work in, and that's, that's my gallery, is the applied world, where it's used for a purpose and to communicate a specific message. Well, I've been doing this, uh, working in graphic design as a grunt in the line, essentially for 30 years now. This actually is my close to 35th year. Basically, it's just been uh, moving up the, the food chain. Uh, I started out as an illustrator, but I drifted away from that and got more into pure applied design. Worked as an art director, a, uh, a creative director, and of course as a designer as well. And then uh, the last 10 years, I've been working here uh, as a teacher uh, in graphic design at the University of Central Florida. But I still keep my own client base going. I, I stay active in the industry. You have to. You have to do that to bring it into the classroom. So you have to put a separate layer and you have to put an action, a stop action on that layer. In the scene. In the scene, yes. I like this deckled edge. You I teach most of the advanced level courses. Uh, those are listed as advanced graphic design, special problems in graphic design, advanced computer design. The advanced graphic design uh, is primarily there to introduce the students to campaign-driven elements. And what we do is, as soon as I get them in there, they get handed their first campaign where they have to design collateral material and broadcast material, and that covers a wide, wide spectrum of uh, taking one concept and adapting it to a lot of different delivery systems. That's the flattest lenticular yeah. I think I've ever seen in my life. Well, because I was trying to get it squared. I try to take each student as an individual. I like to see where their strengths lie. Some students may be uh, much more proficient in typography. Some may be in generating images. The bottom line on all of them, though, is we teach them to think first. Because the most important thing is the concept. It has to be clear. It has to communicate. If it gets lost in the visual material, then you fail that client, or you fail your own personal uh, standard but it has to communicate. I try to get them to explore and explore options. Don't give up after you get one idea. Push that idea further. Take it in an entirely different direction from where you may have started. This is going to be their last opportunity to really do that. Once they get in industry, there's going to be a lot of constraints put to them. 
And if they have the opportunity to play now, that's going to develop their conceptual skills better and that's going to make them again more valuable to where they go in that organization. Every artist goes through periods of dry spells where creatively they feel like they're not pushing as far as they can. That can lead to one of two directions. One, give up, go into something else, and I see this happen all the time, especially in applied design. The other type of person that comes out of that is someone who is persistent, who stays with it, who finds out the core reason as to why it's not working. And when they, they come through that other side of that process, they're gonna find out they're much more creative than they were before. And, and just love what you're doing. If you don't, you know, get out of it and get into something else. I think that's the bottom line with any area of design, especially applied, is you have to stay interested in the medium. You have to find a way to keep that level of excitement and interest up all throughout a career. Uh, if not, uh, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Yeah, those pieces are really efforts on my behalf to try to figure out ways to use some information and images that I've been accumulating over the past 30 years. I've been involved in a lot of uh, documentation of tornado stories and tornado debris and going to sites where tornadoes have occurred and so the piece that was here, the one with the small little TV screen, plays an endless loop of fade-ins and fade-outs of tornado shelters that have been photographed around the South over the last 30 years. If you looked at those clo closely, you'd see various assortments of structures that were reused materials, and, and I think there, you can tell something about the creativity of the culture from the way they reuse materials. And Plus, a lot of things happen with, uh, with the mythology related to tornadoes. People are, they're like the Paul Bunyan stories of the South. You know, my training is primarily as a sculptor, but I, I'm a painter and photographer and a short story writer, and I do books, and I do photography. So, you know, as you cross all those different boundaries, and my primary interest is, in most cases, documentation or expression, so I use pretty much whatever is available to me. When I do a one-person show, the work generally incorporates painting, sculpture, prints, drawings, a, a wide range of work, and that that really comes about, I think, from being a full-time artist for 30 years and working on a wide range of, of work and, and entertaining myself. You know, when you wake up in the morning and, and you go to work at 7 in the morning and you work in your studio till 7 at night, you don't like to repeat yourself. It's fun to train, change around do different things. So. I think I probably got into the habit of doing different things to entertain myself and that's led to some, some capabilities in a wide range of, of media. Well, the whole history of classical art is the history of precognition, the intuitive response, the closure, and the desire to show your skills to the public and be congratulated on your skills. Having this exhibition here was really an interesting point to branch out and discuss other topics about contemporary American work and contemporary international work. Actually, uh, what's changed in the last 500 years? What, what do the public expect? What, what's expected of artists? Those kind of things. By the time you get to your master's degree, it's not so much a matter of developing skill as it is having the philosophical understanding and the intellectual understanding of what needs to be done, what things, what people are interested in, what kind of ideas are challenging, and what kind of ideas the public will support. Well, I think the first thing you have to do is you have to choose uh, work which is complex enough and interesting enough to maintain your own personal interest and enthusiasm and passion 
unless you put passion into the work, the public's not going to be much interested in it. You know, so I, from my standpoint, the thing I try to communicate with most to students is how to learn to express yourself and what whatever is unique about you as an individual, how to celebrate that, how to celebrate your unique characteristics and experiences and capabilities, because everyone has unique and different capabilities. So I talk to them about how to improve their work, both structurally and aesthetically and intellectually, and sometimes they agree and sometimes they don't. Makes for interesting conversations. That's a big turning point, really, for me. When something makes that turn where you're no longer thinking about how it was made, but you're just experiencing it, you know? I just want to have that experience. Well, art, I think, is a, more defined in a cultural context, and probably best to think about what is creative, what is inventive, and what is expressive, with the idea that if you do that well enough, it probably will end up being classified as art. And then beyond that, the determination, if it is art, whether it's good art or not, is out of your hands, too. It's in somebody else's hands. So I, I think that's maybe what I pass on to the students. Don't be in, so in, involved in prejudging your work or making decisions about whether what you make is good or bad. Just, you just have to know that it's the best you can do. Let somebody else make the decisions about whether it qualifies as an art or not. When I first started painting, I was very interested in painting large, expressive paintings. I wanted to push paint around. I was interested in a modernist idea about painting. I became obsessed with the idea of working expressively and working with color and you know the, the materiality of paint. But eventually, I realized that really wasn't me. And I became more interested in what is visually poetic. And so, around the year 1990, I started playing with the idea of working much smaller, very intimate, and I became much more involved with working privately in a small studio space. And the work became very small, very tedious, very compulsive, very precious. And I entitled that series Voices, and that series Voices Continues. Images can stand alone. Images cross cultures. Images can do what words can't do in a time that we need to be communicating globally, and yet language barriers and cultural barriers oftentimes keep us from able to, being able to do that. So like music, um, image making, it crosses cultural barriers, and it allows us to communicate on a pure level. I'm going to talk to you about that notion of beginning to find your own voice. And I want to talk a little bit about going from traditional, observable imagery into the realm of the abstract. And then we'll go from there. We'll play with it. And also... I teach two classes paint primarily paint in painting. Smaller. In beginning classes, I do a lot of demonstrations. And I try to show a certain vitality. And I give them multiple ways of mixing paints, working with various sizes of canvases, and the idea is to work back and forth. You might want to express a sense of care and sensitivity, and you might want to be very tender with the images that you're trying to develop. You may want to be working with aggression, uh, maybe chaos. Fun, huh? Of course, you don't want to have your good clothes on. The idea is to take something mundane and to transcend the image and make it something that is compelling. And to do that in a way where they make formal choices that best reflect the concept that they have. It's fresh. It has some kind of vitality that I would think that um, 
it would be a good idea to start and stop. Start again. Okay. Do several. Wow, it's truly beautiful. It's truly beautiful. And it's very, very fresh. advanced painting, they take those issues that they learned in intermediate and we begin to deal with work that is related. We do a great deal of work with sequences or series so that students have an opportunity to explore a subject thoroughly. Asian people were constantly degraded all day and nobody ever said anything about it. And so, you know, it just infuriated people saw it. And so that's why it's taken down. People have no idea what the hell I'm doing with my work and like, I think just being an artist, it's always going to come with the territory. Yeah. I think that it enhances the art for you to be in front of us talking about it. And I think it takes it to a different level. And I think in the future you may consider wanting to make a film. Or you might consider having a, a sort of lecture or performance. There's a concentration on what they're interested in, and I try to get them from doing that poorly sometimes to doing it excellently. Thank you so much. Good. The idea is to develop a dialogue and sort of emerge into the paintings and get a a real sense of what the concerns are and but I'm most interested not so much in the image itself but in what is revealed through the image. It's not about what's being depicted as much as it is the process that an artist leaves behind. I think certain people have talent. They have the hands and they are able to render. They are very visual. They are more attuned to visual things. But that's only one one hundredth of what it's all about. I think curiosity, uh, an ability to be an analytical thinker, but at the same time to be visually empathetic, to have a sensitivity to nuances. So yeah, it's it can be taught. That's what we're doing here. However, I think a certain type of person comes to the arts and then you nurture that and you help that to develop. That's the goal. The road to becoming a professional artist is defined by more than just talent. Passion, hard work, and the ability to think first are surefire practices that lead to success. Plus, by doing the best you can do, your work is bound to be classified as art. For more information on the UCF Department of Art, visit their website at www.art.ucf.edu. On the next gallery, we'll meet an artist whose latest work was inspired by Hurricane Katrina. We'll also visit a printmaker and take a tour through a traveling photography exhibit. I'm B. Boyd. We'll see you next time.